Welcome to the church. I'm Brittany, where our vision is to build a church for God around the presence of God. Thank you for joining us today. Our prayer is that this word aligns you with God, connects you in your daily experience as we all advance his kingdom. As this word encourages you, don't forget to share it with a friend. Amen. Well, hey, you know, uh, my name is Sonny Torres, Pastor Sonny. I'm the lead servant here at the church. I love this is my favorite part. Where our vision is to... Uh, uh, really quick, if you were here last week, we had some guests with us that uh, came all the way from Scottsdale, and uh, we got to uh, connect with them this week. Um, they sent us a, a, a video text, and uh, they, they, um, they said this about the church in, in their closing. They, it was like about, about, I don't know, about three-minute, four-minute text. And in the end, and oh, yeah, the students are dismissed. And... Uh, at the end of that text, this is what they said. They said, what really impressed us the most about your church is that in unison, on command, they knew the vision. I mean, he was wowed. They were both wowed at the vision. That this church has caught the vision, bought into the vision. The vision, church, it's not to build up ourselves, but we are here to what? Build up the kingdom of God. We are building a church for God around the presence of God. And they were just really in awe of that. So I just want to commend you all because he says that does not happen everywhere. But we fought for that. We have fought for the vision. Amen. Um, all right. So um, I don't believe there is anything I needed to mention before I get in, no? Okay. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to go ahead and go right into the message today. Um, if you have your Bibles, I want you to please open them up to the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter 2 and 9. Many of you have become very familiar with this verse because, well, it's the verse of the year. Now, also, as you're getting 1 Peter 2 and 9, I want you to also get ready Malachi 3, starting in verse 8. Malachi 3, starting in verse 8. Is Irvin here? Is Irvin not here yet? No? Oh, his wife's here. Amen. Irvin. I love it when God calls an audible. I, I love it when God calls an audible. That means it's his place. It's his room. He has, he has the floor. He has the platform. He has the classrooms. He has the audio and the visual, the cameras. God is in control in this place. Can I get an amen from everybody? All right, 1 Peter 2 and 9, and then we're going to be going into Malachi 3 and 8. If you want my notes, please, I encourage you. Get them today because I'm going to be giving you a lot of scripture today. And I encourage you to go get my notes to keep them for studying and to keep them for referencing. So let's go ahead and stand as we read. That's the, the custom here in this church. We stand at the reading of God's word, 1 Peter 2 and 9. We'll start there. And God's word simply says this. But you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful, marvelous light. And now go ahead and move over to Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse 8. This is what God's word says. We'll be reading 8 through 12. It says this, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants, oh, I went too far. Eight, verse eight. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, 
that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. To see if I I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit. That means won't lose their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. You all may be seated. I want to just share with you an, an opener here before I get, before we pray. Typically, we pray right after the reading of God's word. So to, tar- to start today's message, I want to share with you a, a post that a well-known pastor in the Dallas-Fort Worth area posted this past Monday. I want you to keep in mind that what I'm about to share with you took place uh, this past Sunday. Also, keep in mind the message that was shared from this platform this past Sunday. I'm here to tell you that Holy Spirit is speaking to the body of Christ, not just this church. And what took place here last Sunday took place everywhere. That Holy Spirit had the room. So here was the post. Quote, today was another amazing day in our church. I taught on reformation in our finances. I have been so convicted lately on my limited view on money. It's pretty wild how the body of Christ gives money to various companies for various things without hesitation, but are so concerned about the strict accountability of the money given to the church. People let pastors lead their souls, but they don't trust the same pastors with their money. Why? Because people value money more than their souls. This week in my daily encounter, the Lord said to me, how much money is a lot? And I responded, hundreds of millions. And then the Lord said to me, now repent. I was so convicted about how small we think compared to God. In Matthew 25, the servant that had five talents doubled, that servant, which in today's market would have been valued at 350K, the master said to that one, Well done, you have been faithful with little. Listen, church, 350K was little to God. Think of this, towards the end of his reign, King David's last offering to the Lord was valued at $42 trillion. David's heart was pure and his love for God was revealed on how he gave to God. The conviction the Lord pressed on my heart, this is what he says, was this. The people of God need personal reformation in their finances. I want to share that the word reformation, that was end quote right there. The the word reformation simply means church. It means to improve or amend what is wrong, corrupt, or unsatisfactory. The message that I am about to share with you today, I've, come to tell you, as I say that a lot apparently, I've come to say, I've come to declare, I've come to share, I've come to say, I've come to shout, I've come to do it. The, la- the, uh, the message I'm about to share with you uh, has been planned for some time. Last week's message had no bearing on this week's message. Pat Schatzlein had no idea what I had planned for this Sunday. He had no idea. In fact, I will tell you, I hesitated bringing this message today simply because I felt, well, it, it didn't need to be. I, I honestly felt relieved that I didn't have to come up and share this message. I felt like I had escaped a, a, a big one. I, I, I felt relieved, and then God convicted me. He convicted me. And he said, Sonny, I'm not a liar. I don't change what I said I meant. Stop thinking too little about me. 
Stop doubting me and stop being afraid of the subject of money because my people always ask for it, want it, wonder where it's at, but not enough churches talk about it because they're too afraid. I need you to be ecclesia and call them out. So church, today I have been sent on assignment. He desires his ecclesia to be reformed in all areas of their lives, and that includes their finances. According to our scripture for the year, the Bible says that we are a holy nation. We are a people belonging to God. You know what that tells me, church? That we are consecrated, that we're separated from the way that the world thinks and how the world acts. But here's the deal. We aren't just separated from the ways of the world, and we're not just you know, floating around without a home. But the Bible says that we are a, poli- a people that are belonging to God. We are separated from the world's practices, but we are connected to God and his way of living. So if we're consecrated from how the world functions, we're connected to God's way of functioning, then doesn't it make sense to know how we should function? As God's people. Now last year in July, if you were here, you were challenged to write down your prayer requests on some note cards, if you remember that, and place them at this altar. Now I took those note cards home and I read them. I read every single one of them. Then I placed them on our altar at home and I prayed over them every day in July. And do you know what the number one prayer request was regarding church? Money. Whether it was, I need a job, or I need a new job, or I need financial breakthrough. The number one prayer request surrounded the topic of money. And I believe that many of you here today fasted and prayed in January regarding this topic. I will be honest and declare I did. I have come as a messenger with the answer to your fasting. Now, y'all better get excited about that. (laughs) I mean, seriously. Holy Spirit gave me this revelation during my fast. Why wait for the middle of the year to align my church through my word? He said, do it now. The Lord wants you to get excited about this topic, church, because it is to your benefit. This is not a repeat from last year, uh, uh, last week, church. Nope. This is Reformation Church. Today, I want to bring you a message simply titled, The Secret to Financial Breakthrough. So let's pray. Father, we seek righteousness. Align us right. Teach us your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Here we go. I want to say to you today, I don't want to get to heaven. And I find out that I have missed out on some things. I don't want to be there. I'm just being honest. And I don't want to hear about uh, everyone else's outpouring during their life on earth. And I didn't get to experience that kind of outpouring. The Bible says in Ephesians 3 and 20, it says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. I want, I want them to throw up. I know if they got, they got the quotes perfect. The question should not be, can God do immeasurable things in our life when it comes to our finances? But the question should be, what are we doing that's getting in the way of the immeasurable? Because according to scripture, his power is at work within us, church. So what's keeping his power from working within us? Matthew 6, 19 to 21 says it like this. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Maybe you've heard this. Where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Psalm 119 and 162 says it like this. I rejoice in your promise like one who finds great spoil. Matthew 13 and 44 says it like this. Though the kingdom of heaven is like Uh, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure 
hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all he had and he bought the field. Church, do these scriptures excite you? Because as a believer, they should. I'm here to show you what God's word says about your finances. God wants you to have financial breakthrough. I'm here to encourage you. According to scripture, put this next quote up. Make yourself ready to buy the field. I said, make yourself ready to buy the field. I believe we are ready for breakthrough. Otherwise, God would not have given me the word for the year for this church. You are the church. You are ecclesia. It's time to come out, assembly. I believe that we are on track towards the vision. Every year, we get closer to the vision of this church. What's the vision, church? Come on, somebody. What's the vision of the house? Ay, muy bien, muy bien. Gracias a Dios. All right. I'm going a little, little, un poquito. I believe. I believe it's time for another level. I believe it's time to see your faith in action. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people comment on my own faith, how they wish they had my faith. But can I tell you, honestly, I struggle at times with my faith. But do you know? You know what keeps me believing in times I struggle to believe, church? It's it's not in the music. It's it's not in poetry. It's it's, it's not in what I see or what I have. It's it's God's word. Psalm 77, 11, and 12 is one of my favorite scriptures that I quote a lot. And in fact, I got even more excited when The Chosen in episode, I think it was season season three, uh, it it used, I know, yeah, anyway. And and yeah, it was the finale. They used the scripture, and I'm like, man, that's one of my favorites. Psalm 77, 11, and 12 says this. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works, and I will consider all your mighty deeds. Church, I just have to tell you, I have seen miracle after miracle after miracle after when it didn't make sense miracle after miracle after miracle in my life when I took steps of faith do you want to have that kind of faith church to know that your God he will never let you down when it comes to your finances then let's get your faith in action receive the message today on how you can have financial breakthrough in your life listen i'm not here to condemn you i'm here i've been sent to set you free this is not a guilt laden message you can un, you can unbutton the jacket okay you you can get a little comfortable this is not a guilt laden message This is a break you out, get you free, free your mind, free your worship, free your praise. This is to get you out of the gutter when it comes to your finances. This is that kind of message, church. You know, our heart, our heart as your lead servants is to see you blessed. This message is power and authority. And if you get this, I'm telling you, watch out. You will find, you will find a new level of purpose in your life. We want to see you blessed. As your lead servants, Pastor Brittany and I, we want to see you blessed. Our heart is to see your kids blessed. I mean, we launched TC Fit, and let's be honest. I know there's a lot of people that don't like TC Fit. I've come to that conclusion. It's okay. But I, I'm telling you, we didn't launch it to condemn you. We launched it because our heart is to see you live out your God-given purpose. 
Because we want to see you blessed. And we know that you want to see yourselves blessed. So let us give you what God's word says about how to be blessed. This message is about you having victory, church. I'm not here to get you to give out of guilt. I'm not here to do that. I, I'm, I'm, I, this is not in my notes, but I'm tired. I'm tired of churches. I'm tired of pastors that pimp from the pulpit. I'm tired of them when they come up here and they pull on your, your emotional strings and they don't, use, they don't even use scripture. They, they're just they're using their own words. I can see it. I, I discern them. I, I've just come to tell you, I, I know many of you might have been hurt from the church, especially when it came to your finances. This is not that church. I'm not that kind of lead servant. I, I, I'm telling you, church, I come with a pure heart. I want to see you blessed. I'm not afraid to talk about this subject because we all want to hear about it. We all want more of it. So we might as well know how will that happen. I'm here to remind you that this is about giving, getting you to give out of purpose. Why? Because the God you serve gives out of purpose. I'm here to remind you in case you forgot in case you forgot, you are his purpose. You are his purpose. You, so shouldn't it make sense that we be a reflection of his purpose? Look at John 3, 16. I'm sure this scripture is going to pop up somewhere later today at the football game. Somebody will have the 3, 16 of John up there. And what does it say? For God so loved the world that he, I love this word, gave. He gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God gave. I'm here to say we are, we serve a giving God. And giving is our act of worship back to God. We don't teach to give. We don't teach give to be blessed. We teach give because you should love him that much and trust him that much. Church, are the finances going to turn around overnight? I'll come to tell you, the bill is in the mail. They process that credit card statement. It's in the mail. Well, let me ask you, if you've been eating a certain way for a long time and you want to change how you look, are you going to wake up the next day looking the way that you want? It don't happen overnight. That would be a Holy Ghost miracle with a lot of oil. A lot of oil, a lot of Crisco and <laughs> lard, Mountain Peak, Crisco. I'm going on and on. It don't happen overnight, church. But don't, don't grow weary in well-doing. In both finances and your health, you can break through this mentality about your finances, and you can get onto the road that leads to better. Malachi 3 and 7, I'm going to read that again. It says, ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and you've not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord. I love that. I want to encourage you that your money moves God. God says, I want to return to you. And how does he do it, church? Well, it's really easy. It's through your tithe and through your offering. Now, what I want to do is I want to give you some most frequently asked questions when it comes to tithing. And I didn't give them these, but that's why I encourage you to get the notes because these questions are in there in the notes today. Frequently asked questions when it comes to tithing. And my hope is that through this message, I'm going to be able to answer them all through God's word. Amen? Here's one question. Ready? Should I pay tithe off all increase? It's another frequently asked question. Should I pay off the net or the gross? Here's another one. Why do we pay 10%? Another question. It's one of my favorites here. If I am hurting financially and don't pay tithe, am I okay since we have the grace of God? It's a good one. Is the tithe really holy? Here's another one. 
I know we all want to know, can I expect an increase from my tithe? Let's just get right to that one. I want to know. Cut to the chase. Here's the last one I had. Is it New Testament to pay tithe since we no longer live under the law? Now, Pat covered that one, surprisingly. But I, I want to come from a, a different angle on that one. So I'm going to tackle that last question. Is it New Testament to pay tithe since we no longer live under the Old Testament? testament law this is a good teaching today church it's a good teaching today so let's look at malachi 3 8 through 12 again let's read it. here we go will a man rob god yet yeah, you rob me but you ask how do we rob you in tithes and offerings you're under a curse the whole nation of you because you're robbing me man he used that word a lot bring the whole tithe not some not partial not a piece of it not when you can not an IOU. Bring me the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. Wow, I love that. Says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. Yeah, anybody ever want it? Yeah, test God. You want to test God? This is where he says, test me. And I'll pour out so much blessing, you won't have enough room for it. My God in heaven. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord. Isn't it interesting? He has to keep saying who's talking here because sometimes we might forget who's talking to us. God's talking to us. I love that. He, I love that he loves to talk to us, church. He loves to talk to us. That's why the Bible says in Psalm 27, it's not in my notes, but Psalm 27, 8, my heart has heard you say, come and talk to me. And my heart responds, Lord, I am coming. And all the nations will call you blessed. God's going to show you off. He wants to show you off. Like, like raise up. The, he wants to look, look at, look at Alan. Look at my servant. Look at Derek. Uh-huh. Look at, look at Cree. Just look at him, how blessed he is. Why? Because he listens to me. He follows me. Caesar follows me. Crunk knows me. I know him. Matthew, oh, have you... He turns to the enemy. Have you considered my servant? Look at Matthew. He loves me. You know, interesting about that is that you're in his hands. So when the devil tries, he's, no, you can't have him. He's mine. Why? He's blessed. He's highly favored of the Lord. Church, right away, Old, te Old Testament people say, well, pastor, that scripture you read, that's from the Old Testament law. It's under the law. It's under the law. It's under the law. Old Testament's law. So for all of you who think this way, well, then listen closely. Because what I'm going to teach you is going to give you victory and authority. Matthew 5, 17 through 19 says it like this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law. By the way, this is Jesus talking. Or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of God. What is that saying, church? You are no longer living under the law of tithing. Jesus came to fulfill the law so that you can live a fulfilled life through tithing. Not as one under compulsion to give, but now free to give as an act of worship and thanksgiving for what he did for you, church. Tithing and giving is a New Testament fulfilled freedom. They were, given, they were giving in the Old Testament under the law, and then in the New Testament, Jesus comes and says, let me fulfill it. Now you're not under the law. Now you are free to give because I have fulfilled it. I like what Winston Churchill once said. They can put that quote up for me. We make a living by what we get and a life by what we give. Man, that's good. You get to live because of his grace and mercy over your life, church. But watch this. You give to live a fulfilled purpose for Jesus. Now that ought to excite somebody here today. Do you want to change your future? 
Come on, who wants, who wants to change? Who wants to change their future? Come on, somebody. Then change your perspective on how to live a fulfilled life. I, I do not want to be in the place I'm at right now a year from now. If you do, well, then keep doing what you're doing. But if you don't want to be here a year from now, if you don't want to be here a month from now, come on. If you don't want to be here a week from now, then you got to change the game. You got to change the way you think. You got to change the way you view your God. Your God is not broke on the side of the road with a sign that's begging for money. Your God owns all the cattle on all the hills, and he's ready to give it away. God says, I want to make it rain over your life, but you got to test me. Woo, man. I'm supposed to be teaching. Someone say teach. Don't preach. That's funny. That's why he was in his head. So let's tackle a question here. Why do we pay 10%? This is good. Why do we pay 10%? Why 10? The word tithe in Greek is deca. Deca means 10th. That's where we get 10%. Now, according to Malachi 3.10, the tithe or the tenth belongs to the storehouse. Some of you might be saying, well, what's a storehouse? And what storehouse? Like, okay, there's a storehouse, but what is it and where is it at? Well, the word, the word, the word storehouse, (laughs) I need a. The word storehouse in Hebrew is osar, which means treasury of the Lord's house. I love that. In scripture, whenever people brought tithe and offerings, they brought it to the place where they, three things, worshiped God, sat under the teaching of the Lord, where they fellowshiped with other believers. So let me make it very simple for you all in case you've lost me. If you are a member of this church, I said if you're a member, if you're a member of this church, say amen. Amen. It's it's like about 99% in here, all right? If you're a member of this church, this is where you worship God, sit under the teaching of the Lord, and where you fellowship with other believers. So in other words, mira, this is your storehouse. This is it. This is it. This is it. We're too small. We need a bigger church. We need a bigger storehouse. Well, if we need a bigger storehouse, then we need people to get this message. But listen, church, it's for the benefit of the church body. It's not in my notes. All right. It's not in my notes. God's been blessing some people this week. God's been blessing some people since the fast finished. Blessing people with not just food, but blessing people with all kinds of things. Reports from the doctors. I don't know where that's, I don't know what, the scan. Maybe I have to do it again because I don't see nothing no more. Money, jobs, raises, advances. Come on, somebody. When, and then last week, what happened? We took up the biggest offering we've ever taken in the history of the church. And someone came and started just dropping their jewelry. That's like New Testament stuff right there. I wanted to DM Peter and John and be like, yo, what did you guys do when they dropped the jewelry? Because I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do with this stuff. And if God is blessing if God is blessing, listen, if God is blessing your pastors, if God is blessing people in this church, you don't want to disconnect. <laughs> I've heard it preached, and I, I heard it preached, I heard Paul and, and Yvette Samuel say this week, if, 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 if God is blessing, if, if God is blessing the, the, the pastors or something, he's in the neighborhood. 
He's coming around door to door like, you know, come on somebody. But he wants to know, are, are you home? <laughs> or, or are you out hustling? Are you out trying to do your own thing? God says, be still and know I'm God. I need to know, are you home? Because I'm knocking on your door. I'm in the neighborhood. Come on, church. Lord, I'm supposed to be teaching. What are you doing to me? I want to tell you that giving money to missions is not a tithe. That's not your storehouse. Now we should give to missions. Some of you all like, oh, yes, I don't have to. Oh, he hit me with that. But that's an offering, church. It's not the tithe. Giving money to people on TV, good, not the tithe. Giving money to a friend is not the tithe. That's an offering. Giving money to a ministry within the church is not the tithe. That's an offering. Some of you might have showed up today, or I'm just going to prepare you, help you out. You might show up with your tithe in your pocket, and you come through glorious TC Central, and you see Jehovah Java. And you want to drop some money and say, well, I brought my tithe. It's Jehovah Java. I'm going to give them a little sum, and then I'll give God the rest doesn't work that way now we should be giving in all these examples because according to scripture God loves a cheerful giver but your tithe goes where you worship grow spiritually and grow with other believers you don't believe me then look at where they return the tithe in the Bible and this is not up there but just just you know in Genesis chapter 4 Abel brought his first and best to the altar in Exodus chapter 35 the Israel nation returned their best to the tabernacle in Ezra chapter 1 the tithe was returned to the temple and for all you New Testament people in Luke chapter 21 the people returned to the temple where Jesus was watching your tithe belongs to the storehouse according to Scripture, not anywhere else. I want to encourage you, stay encouraged, that you should be a giver. But the tithe, the 10% belongs to the Lord. That's why we say we return the tithe. Because we're returning back to God what belongs to him. I, I just kind of tell you, we, we, we aren't giving him anything he doesn't already own. So just be grateful. He only asks for 10%. Because it all belongs to him anyway. Here's another question. Can I expect an increase from my tithe? Jesus. I want to know the answer. I'm sure many of you are like, hold on. I got to stop talking to me. I got to check. That. I want to hear this. Can I expect an increase from my tithe? Well, let me give you the short of the long. Yes. But in more ways than your little mind can fathom. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 10 says it like this. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly. So that in all things, and all in the Greek is what? All. All things. At all. There's that word. All times. Having all. Look at three alls. Right. Having all that you need. You will abound in every good work as it is written. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of enrichness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. That ought to get someone excited that God is all about giving to givers giving to givers returning to believers returning to those who obey God's commandments when you are a tither and a giver you touch the heart of God this is one of the love languages of God you ever want to know what one of the love languages of God is why because it's a form of sacrifice and worship. When you return your tithe off of the 40 hours you worked, I know I'm talking to somebody here. You know what that is? That's your sacrifice. You know it. Because you're giving off of everything that you sacrificed with your time and your talents. So no, you don't return from the net. 
you return from the gross. Because the gross is the full extent of what you sacrificed in that pay period. And if there's anyone who knows about sacrifice, it's God and Jesus, right? They both sacrificed off of their gross, right? Which means they gave both. They both gave everything they had. I'm, I just come to tell you, church, don't think God does not understand your sacrifice. When you get your paycheck, don't think God does not understand your sacrifice. When you're going through something and it feels too heavy, don't think God don't understand your sacrifice. Don't think, because my Bible says that my Savior on his way to Calvary, he fell. He dropped that cross. He got tired. He knows how we can get tired. But he got back up because he said, don't grow weary in your well-doing. Church, he knows the sacrifice. Listen, tithe and offering are the only thing you can do that is omnipresent. Pastor, what in the world did you just say? But when you're a giver, it allows you to touch anywhere in the world at one time. Follow me. If we say that God is omnipresent, which means he's everywhere at the same time. I come to tell you, the devil is not everywhere at the same time. Don't give the devil too much credit. Don't give the devil too much power, okay? Some of you be like, oh, the devil. Pop all four of my tires. No, you just haven't bought new tires in a while. Because you can't be saying he popped on my tires and someone, you know, another member of the church say, oh, the devil, he's at it again. Oh, he got, he, 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 my, my refrigerator broke and then the, the, the bin on the side. And maybe I'm just talking to myself. The, the bin fell and it broke and I went to go find on Amazon. It was like $80 to replace a bin. And I, I you know, for a second, I'm like, the devil. I said, wait a second, the devil's too, he's so, he's so concerned about my refrigerator. I don't give the devil that much credit. The refrigerator's old, dog. Got it. I need, need a new refrigerator. But give the devil too much credit. He's not everywhere at the same time, church. But Jesus is. He's everywhere at the same time. So listen, church. If he's everywhere at the same time, got to get this. Then don't you want God everywhere when it comes to your finances? Do you want to limit God to one place in your finances? Do you want, you just want God in your savings account? You just want God in your, your little checking account? How nice. Don't you want God in your IRA? Don't you want God in your 401k? Don't, don't you want God in your retirement plan? Don't you want God in your life insurance policy? Don't you want God with your children? Don't you want God, do you want God just in your finances? But God has said, I want to bless you in all areas, in all ways. Don't you want God with your children? Don't you want God with your grandkids? Don't, some of you in here, you want God with your pets? I prayed for a lot of pets since we started this church, so don't lie to me. I prayed for a lot of, a lot of pets. Don't you want God, if young adults, you want God in your education? Some of you youths, getting ready to take a lot of youths to Yuma this, this week. We ain't coming back the same. Nevaeh, we're, Nevaeh, we ain't coming back the same, Nevaeh. You going back changed, girl. She's acting embarrassed right now. But come Sunday, I'm here to tell you there's going to be a roar come out of that girl. Why? Because when God gets a hold of his people, he sets them free. Oh, yeah, church. I'm not ready. I'm not ready, Clarence. But don't worry. I'll call you. Don't worry, sir. I saw you creeping. Creeping. You scared my security. Just kidding. Do we, do we want God just in our finances? We want him everywhere. God wants to be everywhere, church. So give him access everywhere you learn to be, a, when you learn to be a giver. Luke 6.38 says like this, give and it shall come back to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. We poured into your lap, for with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Come on, somebody. Here's another question. Is the tithe holy? 
Well, earlier today, I read 1 Peter 2, 9, which said what? We're a holy nation. That means we're consecrated. We're separated. The 10% is separate from the rest of the finances that God is giving back to you. He asks you to keep it holy. He's asking you to keep it separated. He's saying don't confuse it with the other 90%. Let's look at Malachi 3 and 8 just for reference. Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithe and offering. Leviticus 27 and 30 says, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. In other words, God says, it's not yours. You don't have a right to keep it. You're robbing me, he says. You're taking something that belongs to somebody else. It's a part of God, church. Can they put this quote up for me? Billy Graham once said it like this. One of the greatest sins is when we rob God of what belongs to him. He goes on to say, we wonder why we are in debt. Actually, we're not giving when we give God our tithe. It already is his. This is a debt we owe. It is not until we have given our first tenth and then to begin to make an offering that we actually begin to give. I love that. Now, let me show you a story in Scripture. Look at the Garden of Eden, for example. God told Adam and Eve, you can have everything here, but don't touch mine. That tree, that's mine. And do you know what happened, church? It happened then, and sadly, it happens today. Man became obsessed with the very thing they shouldn't be touching. There's something about man, isn't there, that makes them want what is not theirs. Man is always obsessed with the things they cannot have. We've been doing this since preschool days, y'all. We have, we have all of the toys, Christmas, but I want to touch that, and I want to play with that, and I want that. But you were told, no, you can't have that. Don't touch that. That doesn't belong to you. That will hurt you. You hear God? That will hurt you. Come on, somebody. Malachi 3, 6 declares this. I, the Lord, do not change. I love that. He doesn't change, church. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same yesterday, today. He doesn't change, church. I'm here to tell you that in your garden of Eden, God says you can have everything, but don't touch this tree. When you think about it, the principle of tithing started way back in the garden of Eden. God gave man dominion over everything, but this, he said, return dominion back to me. I love that. Listen, everything you have is what God gave you. And if it means you can have all of this and the family and the house and the friends, but you can't touch this, church, it's simple. Don't don't touch it. Don't touch what's God. I'm trying to set you free. I'm trying to break. Come on, somebody. I'm trying to give you the secrets to financial breakthrough. Just don't touch what belongs to God. Now, I know we all need more money. I need more money. Who needs more money? Raise your hand. If you didn't raise your hand, let me know what your routing number is. I'm going to take all your money because you don't want it. I'll take it. I want more money. I want money. And that's why we're constantly, uh, uh, oh, did I jump? Oh, I know we all need more money, yeah. But that's why we're constantly tempted to take God's 10%. We're all tempted, church. Too many times, put this quote up. Too many times we don't give God what is right. Instead, we give him what is left. Man, that is so good. Now, can I be honest with you? I need money. Who needs money? Yeah, I need money. Why do I? I I got a house mortgage. I got a car payment. It ain't cheap to buy a car. My first car I bought was a 1996 Chevy S10 pickup truck, 2.2 liter. Zero to 60 in five years. 
287.45 a month. And I was late every single payment. Shame on me. You can't buy a car like that. That, that now uppers of seven, eight, nine hundred dollars. I walked in the dealership. They thought they thought they could bamboozle me. I whittled that guy down. I said, You don't know who you're talking to. I'm a son of the king. Some of you need to walk with some authority in the place and say, wait a second. You could have done that with all the devil's children, but I'm God's son. I'm God's daughter. Come on, somebody. You got to take authority, man. But I know I need money. My kids, they, my kids want things. Your kids want stuff. Your grandkids, you Gigi's, papas, mamas, me, ma's, and all that. You know who you are. You, you know, they want stuff. I want to bless my family. You want to bless your family? I want to bless. I want to give good gifts. As the Bible says, give good gifts, right? Good. Come on, somebody. Is there anyone here who like who is like me? Come on, let's not let's not beat around the bush. And throughout my life, I have always been tempted to touch the tithe. Always been tempted. Don't think just because you save set apart don't mean the temptation ain't gonna come. Because the devil don't care. He's no respecter of persons. You say, that just means I have to try harder. But I'm going to bring the temptation. And don't think he won't try to tempt you to touch the tithe. And I tell you, I've come close, especially when you hit hard times. Come on, somebody. You know, when you get to those tough times, you know, when you start adding everything up and you're like, oh, my God, where is it at? And then you look to the left and you see the tithe right there. I'll just pull from that. I've been tempted like that, church. But I've just come to this conclusion. Now I'm here to give you the secrets of financial breakthrough that has helped me. Put this up. This is going to set you free. Put this up. Ready? Stop looking at it like I can't afford to tithe. And start looking at it like I can't afford not to tithe. That's going to set you free, church. When you get to the point where you look at it and said, I can't afford not to tithe. Because somewhere down the road, he's going to get it. Somewhere down the road, God is going to collect. I'm telling you, church. I'm telling you in more ways than you can imagine. So if you want God to be your blesser and not your debt collector, then return what belongs. Don't touch it. Keep it separated. Matthew 6, says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. You know, some Bible translations, they use that word given or added. Given or added. That word in the Greek means a company of soldiers going into battle. Did you catch that? Given or added means a company of soldiers going into battle. So let me read that scripture again and add that instead. It says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be a company of soldiers going into battle. This is going to get you excited. What is God saying? God wants you to give. God wants to give you in return of your obedience all the muscle you will need to win including over your finances. He is your muscle, church. He's your added. That muscle is what rebukes the devourer. It tells the devil, get away. Come on. It's time we make God flex on our behalf. That's why Malachi 3.10 says, test me in this. God's saying, get me to flex on your behalf. Get me to flex towards your enemies. Come on, somebody. The scripture we read in Matthew 6, says, but seek first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek first. Can I totally flip your prayer language today? I mean, totally flip your prayer language. Stop praying first for money and start praying first for righteousness. Have you caught the drift this morning every time I've prayed? Dear Lord, we seek righteousness. I, I, I just come to challenge somebody. The scripture doesn't say not to ask for what you need, but it does give the order of what to ask for. What does it say ask for first? 
righteousness. Can I just be on now? Now, Derek, I'm gonna need a, a, a Clarence, I'm gonna need a little bit of help in here. I come to tell you, church, can you imagine if we would seek God first? First, I know you come to God and I know you have a need. I know that something is happening in your life, something's popped off, something's happening at home, something's happening in the marriage, something's happening with the kids, something's happening with your finances in the checking account. And if you can just come to God and instead of saying, God, I come to you with my children, I I come to you with my spouse and my man. If you would come to God and say, Lord, I come to you seeking righteousness. Lord, I just want to come to you right now. I know what I need. I know what I want. But Lord, your word says, seek first the kingdom of God and righteousness, right standing. I want to stand right before you. You know what God says? He says, I got a whole truckload right here and it's waiting for you. I got a whole beep, beep. He wants to give you a whole truckload, church. But he wants to know, now what are you going to ask for first? Are you going to ask for healing? Are you going to ask for deliverance? Are you going to ask for your spouse? Are you going to ask for your children? Are you going to ask for your church? Are you going to ask for your mind? Are you going to ask for your, come on somebody. If you say, Lord, I seek righteousness, God says, add it, add it. Get, let me give you add it. Why? Because you seek what is right. You seek what is right. Seek first righteousness. Matthew 5, 6 says, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. Filled with what? Anything and everything you need, church. The answer to your prayers is found in righteousness. Are you living a righteous life, church? Meaning, are you living right according to God's word? Because if you are, it's only a matter of time before breakthrough happens in your life including your finances. Seek righteousness. I'm going to put this quote up for me. Show me somebody who is always in need or always broke. And I'll show you somebody who does not tithe or they have areas in their life that is undisciplined. Over and over and over again. Church, I raise my tithe before I give it. You ever wonder why churches do that? Some, some don't even know why they do it. They just do it because they just do it. You know why? Why I raise my tithe? Because I want it to see above the problems. I want it to see the promise that Jesus has through it. That's why I raise my tithe. Do you know what we get to do when we tithe, church? In closing, we get to be a part of the building process to build a church for God around the presence of God. We want a house that God's pleased with, don't we? A house. What house? This house. This house. Body of believers. Yeah. Don't we want to please God, church? I said, do we want to please God? For all you Old Testament folk, Isaiah 61.8 says, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. And for all of you in New Testament, in the Gospels, Jesus got angry when he saw his father's house being used wrong. I'm just here to tell you this house matters to God. This house matters to God. This house matters to God. This, this matters. This matters. You matter. This house matters, church. And when we tithe, we're building and we're stewarding a house God is what? Pleased with. Since we're on the topic of building, let me add this. To build something requires resources. Luke 14, 28 through 30, I'm not going to read it, but it talks about how if you want to build something, don't you first sit down and figure all the things. You got them all in order to, to build it. If you got enough money, it says. Because then if you don't have w enough, then, the, then they'll ridicule you. That you, you didn't even count the cost. I want, I want you to think about this for a second. I'm closing, I promise. Jesus sits on the throne. I want you to just imagine Jesus right now. He sits on the throne thinking about the lost. Oh, this is so good. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Yes. He sits on the throne. And for some of you in here with a child that's not in church, he thinks about your son and your daughter. For those of you here with a, a, a spouse who's not sitting beside you because they just don't want to come to church. He sits on his throne on the right hand of the Father. And he's thinking about your spouse. 
If you're here and your grandparent, he's thinking about your grandkids. If you're sitting here today, you got a, a friend, a very good friend, dear friend of yours, but they're not saved. They don't know Jesus. He's thinking about them. If you got family members that are not saved and you pray for them, he's thinking about them. He sits there day and night while they worship around his throne. He sits there. He thinks about the lost. Thinks about them. And you know what he's doing? He's thinking about, now where can I send them where they'll be found? Where can I who can I trust that's building a house for me and for them? He sits on the throne and he looks across the globe. He looks into the Western Hemisphere, looks into the Southwest region, looks upon the state of Arizona, zeroes in on the metropolitan Phoenix area goes a little bit southwest and sees a church in Avondale, Arizona called the Church PHX that says this is the year of ecclesia. It's the year of the what? It's the year of the church. The year of the called out assembly. He says, my God. Jesus looks says, my father. <laughs> my God, my father. I found him. I found a church that's building a church for you around your presence. I found a church where I can send the lost. I found a church where they steward well. I found a church they're not interested in being broke, busted, and disgusted. They're not interested in being like they were last year or last month or last week. But they are interested in stewarding well, building well around your kingdom, Father. That's where I'll send them. That's where I'll send your sons and your, that's where I'll send your family members. That's where I'll send your friends. That's because you're building for my kingdom. You're building for the, for the future. You're, you're building church, building a presence, building around his presence, building around the presence of God. He says, I can trust this house because they, they understand the secrets to financial breakthrough. Thank you for joining us today. If this message has blessed you, we would like to encourage you to share it with a friend. To learn more about us, find us online and on social media at The Church PHX. See you next time.